Not very detailed digression about the importance of nonlinearity. There are techniques to work out the stability, which are called Lyapunov exponents and a range of other techniques. So I'll talk about those in detail if I give a, an intensive course or a longer course in this area. But nonlinearity is essential. So what's nonlinearity in the Gutman model? It's simply wages multiplied by employment. Now, if you think about a lot of neoclassical work, they often try to work out reasons to use perfect competition to argue the wage is constant, getting rid of one variable by saying it's constant given perfect competition. Well, nonsense. The two variables, wages and labour, are both variables at the same time. Multiplying them together gives you that fundamental nonlinearity. Um, but the dynamics you can get out of this system is still very limited because there are only two dimensions to it. You have the employment rate and the wages share of output. Now, one way to see the limitations here uh, is a, a graphical system because when you're describing a set of differential equations, you have the equations themselves which determine an overall phase space you can be in, but particular initial conditions will give you a particular loop within that. So if I start right in the equilibrium, then I just simply stay in the one point. If I'm, say, you know, 2 percent away, then I'll cycle around 2 percent away. If I'm 7 percent away, I cycle around 7 percent. You can actually imagine drawing a graph, a piece of paper, with lambda on one axis and omega on the other. And with the differential equation system, one, no solution can intersect with any other solution. So if you say, well, therefore, I've, if I'm going to draw a solution, whatever I draw has to involve a curve which doesn't intersect with any other curves, including itself. Okay? You, can't, you can only intersect if you go back to precisely the same value. You can't intersect in one, one particular dynamic solution can't have two different values or this uh, cutting through itself. So what you've got to do is draw a, a curve on a, on a surface and not intersect with it. Now if you try to do that, there's two ways you can do it. Either you just put a perfect, perfect cycle, so you go back to the beginning again, or you spiral in to the centre, or you spiral out to a curve, or you spiral into a curve and don't go any further, or spiral out from that curve. Very, very limited range of possibilities. But when you throw in a third dimension, it's like saying move your hand in a box and never hit the same value twice. And you can do anything you like. You can go anywhere at all. Okay? So the complexity comes out of that third dimension. And with Minsky, the way that I brought in a third dimension, it, it wasn't done intentionally. I didn't know about chaos theory when I first built this model. I just saw it suddenly happen in my own models. But to bring in debt, I had to first of all have capitalists wishing to invest more than their profits during a boom, they have to borrow money. Or less than their profits during a slump, they pay some of their debt backwards. So I replaced that unrealistic assumption with a realistic one. Now this is again a common thing in dynamic systems. When neoclassicals try to expand their equilibrium model, but hang on to the belief that it's an equilibrium, they have to assume crazy things to go from one step to another. So if you go from a model of supply and demand where you're just talking about buying and selling goods now, you assume equilibrium. Okay? Then if you want to talk about buying and selling money and loans, what does Fisher do? Assumes equilibrium throughout time. Or rational expectations, assumes you can predict the future. Mad assumptions. When you're working with a dynamic model, when you tend to add complexity to it, you say, oh, that's an unrealistic assumption, let's get rid of it. So it's unrealistic to say capitalists invest all their profits. Because not only would it say that they, um, um, that they would they can invest exactly what they earn, it's saying when they made a negative profit, they'd go around smashing up factories. Okay. So it's unrealistic. And funnily enough, this argument that capitalists invest more during burns than slumps was empirical result found by Famer and French, who were two of the most conservative people in finance. And they didn't publish this as a journal, unfortunately, but this is a, a, line, a couple of lines from a working paper of theirs saying, debt seems to be the residual variable in financing decisions. Investment increases debt, and hiring, higher earnings tend to reduce debt. Well, it's a differential equation. That's saying the rate of change of debt is investment minus profits. And what you need to do is have an investment function which differs from the rate of profit, and you've got a third dimension in the Minsky model. So that's what I used in my 1995 paper, which I've linked to there 
on financial instability, and that happened to add a third dimension. But this, the way that I discovered chaos was by generating it in my own models. So, first thing I had was a, I'm just going to show you how to do this. This is the, the straight Goodwin model, uh, which I've shown you beforehand. What I'm going to do, I'll, I'll just actually, I'll dive inside those boxes. Notice these boxes here? Okay. They're groups, which just mean there's something which is fairly messy and complex I can put inside a little box and hide its, uh, its, its complexity. But I'll show you how to get inside that. Well, let's just uh, run the simulation. So if I zoom on that particular box and zoom in, that's just a relation for exponential population growth. So rather than consuming a constant population, I've now got population growing exponentially and the same thing for labour productivity inside that box. So you can zoom in, you can edit them, change them, go back again. Now what I'm going to do is delete this line first of all and I've got to bring in an investment function. So what I have to have is the rate of profit. So I've got capital here and I'm now bringing uh, profit here and capital here. So I'm going to divide uh, pro the ab absolute profit by the level of capital to get a rate of profit, which I'm calling pi underscore r. Whack that there. And then I'm going to emulate the equation I've got for workers to say, well, let's say there's some equilibrium rate of profit that means capitalists invest exactly what they earn at that rate. So I call this pi underscore e, and then I subtract one from the other, and I've got whether profit is greater or lower than this equilibrium level of profit, and then multiply that by a reaction parameter, the constant, for how much more capitalists invest if the actual rate of profit exceeds that equilibrium rate. So I've got that, and then this is now an investment function. So I define invention, investment function as like a wage function up above there. And then multiply that function and say this is the proportion of output that will be used for investment. So I can bring down output here and multiply output by that investment function. And I now wire the whole thing up again. So capital divided, profit divided by capital is the rate of profit. Subtract that. I subtract the equilibrium rate from that, you've got the gap between it and the actual rate. Multiply by the slope function, you've got the investment function. Multiply by output, you've got the level of investment. If I simulate it, I still get cycles, closed cycles. But I haven't made it a three-dimensional model yet. That's stage one of doing that. And just to hang on, I didn't want to zoom it again. Here we go. So that's embedded there. I'll just stop that. So you bring that up. Oh, cut. Stop. <laughs> okay, that's the model. So you can so I'll just zoom inside on that particular part there because it's a bit small on screen. Let's pan over and take a look at it. So that's what I've added to say, just an investment function. But that gives me the possibility for investment differing from profit. But if I do that, and I've actually got in this model now, investment does differ from profit, but I'm not explaining where it comes from. Well, now what I've got to bring in is debt. So I'll just simulate that again just to show you you get those same closed cycles. It's just a different shape. So adding debt, well that's incredibly simple as it happens. So now what I've got is I've got investment over here. If I subtract profit from it and create a new variable called D, the debt, which is a new integral variable, and now I've just added a minus key here using that same trick of just pressing the minus key on the canvas. Another integral block, call it D. That's now debt. And of course, if I multiply debt by the rate of interest, I then get the interest payments that capitalists now have to pay to bankers, who are still only implicitly in the model. So I then put a multiply by a key there and create a new variable called I and T for interest. And now copy that and bring it over here to profit because profit is now net of interest payments. So I then subtract interest payments from output as well as wages, wire that all up. So investment minus profits is the rate of change of debt multiplied by the rate of interest uh, times interest payments and you subtract interest payments from output as well as wages to get the actual level of profit. So I've made this model consistent. Now let's bring down a, a graph of this is find the debt to output ratio now. So that's D, and I'm going to divide it by Y, and call that the debt ratio. Okay. 
D underscore R. Bring down a graph. Make it a bit bigger. Let's right click and you choose resize. Wire it up. D divided by Y is the debt ratio. And simulate. And notice the loop is no longer closed. Okay? It's, it looks like it intersects actually in three dimensions. You're not seeing the third dimension. The third dimension is down here. And notice that it's converging here. This will converge to equilibrium. Okay. So just to show you that one. There are the cycles over time. Now, that's given a particular set of parameters. Now what about it? I forgot to animate that particular one. Ah! Okay, pardon me, I've got to change the... I thought I'd already done this animation, but obviously I'd forgotten to do it, so... Pardon me. Which one do I will first of all? Then add animation, play. Save it. Okay. Back to the animation again. I can now change the parameter values. So I'm going to make this using what's called a slider, so I can change the parameter value either for or during a simulation. So I'm changing the equilibrium rate of profit, making it uh, potential, I think I started at uh, a lower value, meaning that the capitalists are now content with a lower rate of profit, so if they get a higher rate of profit, they want to invest more. And then I'm making them more reactive, so I'm making them a 10 to 1 reaction for any gap between the actual rate of profit and the equilibrium rate. And simulate this model, and you'll see a very peculiar dynamic. I want to check this one out, but this was a total surprise to me when I first did it back in 1995 with a nonlinear function, and I'll show you that in a second. You simulate this, oh, it's equilibrium again. But notice what's happening on the left hand side there. And notice how over here, cycles and unemployment are getting, employment are getting smaller. Great moderation, you might call it. But then it starts to get more violent. And what you've got is a debt-induced breakdown. It tends to be a particular class of chaotic models that I've since learned about from my colleagues in mathematics. It's called the uh, inverse tangent route to chaos. There's another name for it as well. But that was totally unexpected. There's nothing in Minsky's hypothesis to tell you to expect this convergence followed by divergence. So I, when I wrote my paper about it, I was quite stunned by that. I actually wrote the paper back in 1993, or the model in 1992, the end of 1992, I think December. I wrote it up in, in early 1993. It was published two years later. So I wrote it before the Great Moderation. But I finished with a, what I thought was a rhetorical flourish, saying that the chaotic dynamics explored in this paper should warn us against regarding the period of tranquility in a capitalist economy as anything other than a lull before the storm. Yeah. Yeah, I think now the question is uh, would be uh, like to make the uh, to make the, uh, what you take the the, the the other the other point of view is um, what makes you think that uh, that we uh, like the set of parameters that leads to yeah. uh, unstable or uh, like such this type of attractors yeah. are realistic I mean what makes you think yeah. that uh, like like the, the, the real economy uh, May, may have this, this type of behavior and not, and not just convert, convergence of behavior all the time. The real world we're in is a good enough explanation for <laughs> it. I mean, it, 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 well, I mean, maybe it's just transient and we are, we are, we are converging to this. Um, not when you look at those debt data I showed you at the beginning of the, of the, of the lecture. Mm -hmm. Like, hypothet hypothetically, it could be in a stable region. Mm -hmm. But if you look what's happening to debt, I mean, the reason I started coming out and making public warnings about expecting a crisis. It was back in December of 2005, like 10 years after that paper came out. I'd sp I spent a whole lot of time um, work running a conference, writing a book on complexity, editing a book on complexity. Then I wrote Debunking Economics, and I got involved with all sorts of fights with neoclassicals over that. And in 2005, I thought, right, I'm going to write my Minsky book. And this, just before I started doing that, I got given a contract to do a, a, be an expert witness in a case on predatory lending. And in right, because they knew I was uh, focusing upon debt, 
this is a the legal legal aid organisation in New South Wales, and I was writing my submission, and I made this throwaway line of saying debt to GDP ratios have been rising exponentially. Now, being the expert witness, I couldn't rely upon hyperbole, and I thought, well, I haven't looked at the data for a long time. Uh, it's probably rising close to exponential, but it won't really be. So I better go check the data, graph it, and then I'll have to modify that work with something else. So I downloaded the data. It's 2 o'clock in the morning I finally got it all assembled. I had quarterly data for GDP and monthly data for debt. Had to add together a couple of series to get the debt ratio. And I then took one look at it and my jaw hit the floor. I said that's virtually pure exponential. It kept for a couple of super exponential humps on top of it. When I did the correlation coefficient, the correlation of the data with a simple exponential function was 0.9912 okay, over 40 years at that stage. And I thought, there's got to be a crisis. Somebody has not warned about it. Bang, I dived in. So empirically, I could have found you know, convergence going on and so on. And it also comes back to Minsky's hypothesis about the tendency towards euphoric expectations. Okay? And in a simple way, the dynamics that I see going on there, and I'll just point that out to you here, um, notice the debt ratio, up and down, okay, cycles, so rises and falls in a series of cycles and humps. And if you think about it at a very simple level, when you say capitalists invest more than they earn during a boom, and then try to repay it during a slump, when they repay it during the slump, their profits are going to be lower than they expected. So there's a tendency for the debt level to go to ratchet up over time, okay? And then once you get over the particular point where the price, you're not actually falling into hell, expectations recuperate and you start the whole thing from a higher level of debt. Well that's you know, very, very stylistically very close to what you see in the actual data. So I, I take the point that you know, the real world is my defence. <laughs> so simply adding, and what I've already done there too by the way, I've simply added in genuinely debt financed investment. I haven't included Ponzi investment in that model because Ponzi investing is borrowing money and not building extra factories. Okay? Ponzi investing is gambling on the share prices or the house prices. It's not actually building new productive capacities. So it's like a Schumpeterian version of a crisis rather than a Minsky one. Yeah? Uh, Steve, who will believe in the investment profit relationship? I mean that investment is equal to profits. Only in the classical economies. Keynesian economists would say that that is a saving constrained economy. Yeah. Meaning that profits uh, will generate an impact on investment and you cannot invest more than you, can, yeah. you, you got from um, the profit side. Mm. Of course, in a Keynesian view, then uh, only part of profits uh, is going to finance investment. Mm. You also have con capital consumption. Yep. You have the retention ratio. Yep. Uh, and, and also you have an, a, financial, a financial system that can be financing the real sector of the economy, which yep. is the debt factor that you are adding to your model. And also on the other side of the equation, you, 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 you have investment, of course, but you have also the repayment of the investment. Yep. So uh, you have uh, several sort two sources of funding and also uh, two mm, variables that are low variables on the other side of the equation. Yep. Uh, is your model uh, catching all these or only one of these factors? You own only the debt factor or you have uh, the debt retaining? When, when, I, it, it, when I built this model first, I simply had the debt factor. And that was like, a, I generated the, qual the qualitative behavior that we later saw, but that I was pretty pleased about. But I knew it was incomplete because I didn't have debt repayment. I didn't actually have explicit money. So the whole reason for developing the Minsky program was to be able to build a genuinely monetary model where all those factors can be included. And I'll show you that tomorrow, sticking with just the just the, the three equation system today. But that's why I designed Minsky program so I can actually include all that. And you can include all that. I haven't quite got there yet, because it's been really work on writing the developing the software code, but the program itself can now support all those levels of complexity. So, okay. So but notice that um, I got cycles without any nonlinear behaviour. Okay? I had linear behaviour by workers related to the employment rate, linear behaviour by the capitalists related to the profit rate. So the, the non-linearity that you see there, that sort of behaviour, comes out of the structure of the model. It's not something which is caused by an assumption 
of nonlinear behavior. Okay? And that's extremely important because, again, a lot of neoclassicals, and I had a very um, angry exchange with a particular neoclassical in New Zealand at the central bank when, they were, when the Treasury, rather, was talking about getting me to build a model of the New Zealand economy using my software. He was saying, it's just due to you having exponential functions in the software. Yeah. And I was saying, no, it's not. That's one reason I've built this particular model, which is purely linear, to make the point that no, it's not. Okay? It's structural in the nonlinearities. What nonlinear behavior assumptions do is actually constrain how extreme the results are. Because if you take a look at this model, I've got the employment rate well and truly exceeding 100%. That's because the linear model doesn't stop you going well, well beyond the bounds of the, the actual system. So you bring in a nonlinear assumption. To, to, you assume nonlinear behavior for two reasons. One, it's realistic. Okay? Capitalists don't go around smashing up factories when they get a rate of profit below zero. Okay? Secondly, you can't employ more than 100% of the workforce. You, you do have the issue of a participation rate. So I should actually have my labor to population ratio, I should have the uh, equilibrium point being about 65% or 62% of the population because most of the, you know, up to 40% of the population is not in the workforce but you can drag people out within a enormous wage levels. Your grandmother would be out working you know, with an incredible pay rate. So you can expand it more than I can show just the employment rate, the actual workforce. But when you bring in a nonlinear function, its main role is two twofold, realism, and secondly, constraining your results to realistic ranges. So um, then the, the, the complex behavior comes from the structural nonlinearities, not from the assumptions of it as well. And that behavior as well as you can see there, it looks like convergence and it becomes divergence. You can't get that out of a linear model. Okay? If it looks like convergence in a linear model, it will converge. Okay? If it looks like divergence, it will diverge. This can look like it's converging and then move away, which is like the, the, the Lorenz model I showed you uh, in the first lecture. So it's natural nonlinearity, and then you bring in nonlinear assumptions to, to make it more realistic. So if I, in this particular model, if I zoom inside the wage change function there, I've made it a, a, a inverse quadratic. I've got one minus one over one minus uh, lambda squared coming in there, which means that as lambda approaches 100 percent, that becomes a enormously large number. So you never quite get to the employment rate. rate, rate cutting off uh, reaching 100% because profit falls well below zero. So when I do it, notice the employment rate now doesn't exceed 100%. Okay. So that's the role of bringing in a nonlinear function. Realism and then confining your results to a, realist, to a realistic range as well. And just to show you that particular one. in more detail. So we actually that, that wage change background is getting in the way of reading the equation. It's one of the things you have to do with you develop software you're going to move that up so it doesn't block the equation, get it out of the way of the block. But that's a A over B uh, minus a C times lambda squared plus D just gives you the capacity of designing a hyperbolic equation with particular slopes. And that's what gives me a nonlinear wage change function. And if I simulate, you, know, you bounce, you get the 100% and you bounce. You don't keep on going straight up. And notice the, the shape here is confined below 100% now. But it's still exactly the same qualitative behavior. It's still just in two dimensions. And now I've, with the debt relationship inside, they've now got nonlinear assumptions for both wages and the investment rate now. So to show you that one, exactly the same functional form. <coughs> Pardon me. And I simulate it. And the same qualitative behavior comes out, diminishing cycles initially. But then what do you do? You're passing through a vortex. That's what I saw when I first graphed the, my model back in 1995. And ultimately, you come out the other side and you explode. And you start to get more and more humps turning up in the debt to GDP ratio. And there's your apparent stability caused by divergence at a later stage. And finally, this will break down. 
ultimately goes to zero employment, uh, infinite debt. So that's, I'll let that one go by, but that's, that's also embedded inside the model there. So that's chaos coming out of simply adding debt into the system, and it's a structural thing. It's not a, imposing an assumption of a particular type of behaviour to generate the result. It's just saying capitals borrow money to invest. But there's plenty of limitations. You were talking about them a moment ago. I haven't really got effective demand inside there. Okay? Investment determines what consumption is going to be as a leftover in the model, the way it's set up. There's no explicit monetary sector. And I've got debt there, and I'm implying that debt then enables you to finance investment, which is what we find empirically, but I don't have the way in which debt creates money, enabling you to expand the economy. And there's no price dynamics. That's, that's why you've got this mad, crazy cycles. But what we, we didn't see dramatic ups and downs. We saw this to collapse in 2008. So there's something else that's missing from there, which is largely price dynamics. So I've developed Minsky to get past those problems. And Minsky is just another system dynamics program. The first one that was developed um, became known as, I think that was actually Vensim, okay, or Stella. And, that, and then m engineers invented Simulink in a program called MATLAB. Has anybody here used MATLAB? Okay. So Simulink is part of MATLAB. It's been there for 30 years or 20 something years. There's plenty of programs exactly like Minsky. The one thing that Minsky has which is unique is what I call a godly table. And I'll talk about that in the next lecture. <laughs> yeah. Not, not the last one, not the, the vortex one. But, uh, this one, this one. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder in, in what, it, what extent uh, this could be a strong argument uh, against, uh, say, all the uh, uh, econometri econometrics hypothesis. Because if you take the, the mean of, of uh, this pattern, yeah. then you, you, you end up with the center of this, of this pattern. And you're, you're, you're in, a, in a, a state of the economy that is, is not even, uh, I mean, uh, it's not even uh, in, in reachable yeah. from, the, from the model's point of view. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's like uh, completely uh, absurd to take, uh, to take the means yeah. in, in, in this situation. That's right. I mean, and this is what happens so often with economists. They, they don't realize that you have an un unstable equilibrium. And they also think that the equilibrium is the average. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the data and you have a nonlinear system, the equilibrium and the average will be different amounts. Even if the equilibrium is stable, okay, the average will differ from that. So there's all sorts of errors in, in assuming an equilibrium as a way of modelling the system. And it truly really is, if you see this sort of dynamic going on, then it's crazy to say let's model it as an equilibrium process because equilibrium is the one point the model will never reach. Yeah. Okay. So we can say, we can say that, uh, that uh, economic research uh, sucks. <laughs> That's the one reason I, I do say economic econometric sucks because uh, <laughs> there is an enormous amount of. I mean, we, we, there is there are nonlinear statistical and analytic approaches that you can use. There's a whole range of, as you'd know, nonlinear techniques used in other areas. But econometrics is so dominated by presuming an equilibrium and a, a Gaussian distribution around the outside of it, and so on. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good. Any other questions? <laughs> Okay, we've got a bit of an early finish today, but a, a lot more detail tomorrow. But thanks a lot. See you then.